Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Bridger Layton. I'm the Education Programs Coordinator for the MedHow Conservancy, um, which means that I get to coordinate fun events like this where we get to learn together as a community. Um, you may think that all we do is fundraise for Sunny M Ranch, but we also do things like this. And so um, we're excited to be here with some partner organizations, Home Range Wildlife, Conservation Northwest, and also the Trails Collaborative. Um, there's a bunch of info about each of our organizations kind of at the, the en intro table over there. And so um, if you didn't get a chance to check out the materials, sign up for mailing lists, et cetera, um, that's a good thing to do on your way out as well. Um, and with that, I just I want to thank the Tap House for hosting us. I think it's really fun to have an event like this from time to time where, yeah, we get to kind of sit around a table together and be in a space that's a little cozy. Um, and so thanks to the Tap House for having us. They've been super generous and happy that we're all here on a night when they wouldn't ordinarily be open. Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> um, so I'm personally really looking forward to tonight's talk because I like wildlife and I also like to recreate. And I have a feeling that's <laughs> affinities that I share with many of you in the room. And so, um, yeah, when I heard about the opportunity to have this talk um, on a topic that feels really quite urgent right now, um, I was so happy to get to coordinate. Because uh, I, I tend to think of the way that I recreate or perceive the way that I recreate um, being mostly human powered is kind of low impact, but I think anyone who's ever driven over the pass midsummer can can tell you that that's probably not an accurate perception. And so, um, yeah, as user numbers increase, uh, it's a great time right now to be thinking about how do we inject a dose of intention and um, be really thoughtful about the future of recreation and wildlife and the intersections of the two. Um, so what I'm saying is I organized this private event just for me to learn <laughs> and uh, invited a few of my close friends and uh, I'm happy you're all here. With that, I think I'm just going to hand it on over to Becca Windell of Home Range and Kurt Hellman of Conservation Northwest. Awesome, thanks. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Bridger. Thanks so much to the Met Howe Conservancy for coordinating this event tonight. Again, thanks so much to the Tap House for hosting us all. Um, yeah, as, as Bridger mentioned, my name is Kurt Hellman. I work with Conservation Northwest. I am so just stoked to be able to share some of the research, some of the science we've collected um, about this topic, this intersectionality of recreation and conservation, and specifically wildlife conservation at that. So a little bit more about me. Um, I'm with uh, this organization, as I mentioned, with Conservation Northwest. We connect, protect, and restore wildlife and wild lands all across Washington State. I work on their wildlife and recreation coexistence program, so pretty apt stuff for this. Um, a little bit more about myself. I love recreation, uh, love skiing, especially this time of year. Ski season's awesome. Um, I also love to rock climb, love to mountain bike, um, and I share a deep passion for a lot of the critters that share our public lands. So I have feet planted firmly in both camps and um, just love the work that we've done together with Home Range and Becca. And just, again, very excited to be here tonight with y'all. Thanks, Kurt. Yes, my name is Becca Wendell, and I'm a wildlife biologist and the development director at Home Range Wildlife Research. Um, in addition to being a biologist, I also am an avid recreationist myself. Um, for any of you that know me, I absolutely adore trail running and then bike and ski and all those things too. So this is also an area that's really near and dear to my heart. So I'm extra grateful that you all came out tonight um, and took a bit of time to learn with us. So before we dive into things, just want to give you a little overview of the evening and what we're going to be talking about. So first and foremost, we're going to provide just some broad background on wildlife recreation dynamics. Um, second, we're going to start to dive into the details of our report, going into broad implications, and then also some um, species-specific implications for Met House species of interest. Then we're going to highlight a case study um, in a nearby area for some inspiration and then offer some considerations for recreating. Um, with wildlife. Fourth, we're really excited to have Alan Jersick here from the Met Howe Trails Collaborative, who's going to talk a little bit about how local recreation stakeholders are implementing responsible recreation initiatives. And then fifth, we're going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. So excited um, to hear what all you guys want to know in addition. 
All right, so first and foremost, just want to say right off the bat that outdoor recreation is awesome. Um, it is, has really strong ties to our overall health, happiness, and well-being. And then in addition, it's a really critical part of our local economy, especially here in the Met Howe. So for example, there was a 2015 economic impact study that Resource Dimensions put out. Um, and this study indicated that recreation brings in $6.7 million to our local economy annually. And that number has almost certainly increased in recent years. Furthermore, businesses cite nature enthusiasts and recreationists as their highest revenue generating group. So really important to our economy. Um, second, recreation is an important link to natural resource conservation, and it does this by fostering connections and then generally encouraging broad support for conservation. So essentially, it just helps connect the dots between conservation concerns and then what people are seeing and experiencing out on the landscape. So alongside all of the amazing benefits of recreation, there are also growing challenges though, um, especially as recreation's footprint is expanding. So this includes growing populations. Uh, Washington's the second, has the second largest population here in the West, and then Seattle, our largest metropolis, is consistently one of the biggest um, and fastest growing cities in the country. In addition, again, awesome, but recreation uh, interest is increasing, and that means that visitor numbers on public lands are increasing in tandem. And then we'd be remiss not to mention how all of this is affected too by uh, COVID-19 as it's really influenced wildlife recreation dynamics. So for example, you can see in this graph the number of visitors to US Forest Service lands. And you can see this slow, steady increase over the past couple decades. And then COVID hit and we had this massive spike of about 20 million visits in a much narrower time frame. And so then these trends are mirrored here in local data. Um, so this was gathered in the most recent State of the Methow report that the Methow Conservancy put out um, with the number of skier days on Nordic trails. And we see that similar trend where in the winter 2020, 21, we had a bigger spike in user days. So given this increasing recreation footprint, there's also a growing concern around um, implications and potential impacts to wildlife. And this has resulted in a growing body of research on wildlife recreation dynamics and a whole new field of study called recreation ecology. So findings from the vast majority of the research thus far indicate that recreation has negative effects on wildlife, displacing animals in both space and time. And so we'll get into this in a lot more detail shortly. However, I wanna say right off the bat um, that uh, because individual and population level effects, so essentially like whether or not an animal survives or the numbers of animals that we have on the landscape are really hard to measure, much of the literature focuses on these short-term behavioral responses. So for example, um, what this means is that say we have a hiker uh, out on the landscape who encounters a deer on the trail here we have a lot of research looking at behavioral responses like at which point the animal flees and how far it flees and things along those lines. So this is a behavior that we know is then tied to um, having individual impacts on animals like lost foraging opportunities and increased physiological stress responses. However, there really is little research right now making that direct connection just because it's hard to measure. Um, but so we know these compounding short-term negative impacts influence survival to some degree, but yeah, we just, it's, it's a piece of information that's missing. And so as a result, we similarly know a little about how widespread recreation, uh, uh, recreation across the landscape impacts wildlife populations and have a lot more to learn. So in addition to recreation impacts, it, in addition, it's uh, important to note that recreation impacts are context dependent. So they vary based on how sensitive a species is to recreation, the type of recreation, the intensity, timing, the amount of recreation that's happening across an area, um, and then also things like habitat and topography. Furthermore, recreation uh, impacts on wildlife are only one piece of the public lands puzzle. And so, for example, when we're thinking about wildlife conservation on public lands, there's really a wide variety of factors shaping what all is happening out there on the landscape. So we have things like known uh, declines in biodiversity, widespread habitat loss and fragmentation, 
climate change, including the effects of wildfire and changing weather conditions, lack of adequate funding across sectors, staffing challenges and, uh, within management agencies, public land access issues, uh, growing human populations like we talked about before, increased residential and commercial development, and then this piece um, of the puzzle that we're focusing on here today, which is uh, recreation impacts on wildlife. So really the takeaway here is like most things in life, it's pretty darn complicated. Um, so we need information to be summarized locally uh, to help understand the extent of impacts. And so that's what we endeavored to do by writing a report summarizing the existing scientific literature on wildlife recreation dynamics for these 15 species of interest um, pictured here and offered some considerations for limiting potential negative impacts uh, of recreation on wildlife. So this report is being used by Conservation Northwest's Wildlife Recreation Coexistence Program, and it identifies key areas where conservation practitioners can focus as they look at management and policy efforts. Um, and in turn, we're really excited to be here tonight again sharing this report's findings with you all so that you can um, have the best available information as you go out and start planning for your summer recreation um, and are encountering wildlife out on the trail. And so with that, we're gonna give you a broad 10,000 foot overview of the report's finding. It's pretty long and wordy. We have copies in the back and um, we'll have a QR code where you can access the whole thing. But essentially we wanna provide some considerations and narrow down into the key details tonight. So we've broken this up into three overarching areas where we're gonna start with some broad implications of the report, um, dive into some species accounts and trends there across a few different taxa, and then talk about some coexistence strategies. So I'll pass it off to Kurt from there. Awesome, thanks Becca. Um, Becca did a great job kind of painting the complexity that we find ourselves in with public lands and you know grappling with wildlife conservation and the kind of some of the lack of knowledge and it's really hard to find the right data when it comes to that stuff but we also have this key piece of knowledge knowing that recreation is growing and growing and growing and we know that with from short-term negative responses that wildlife can have to human displacement and disturbance from recreation that could be a recipe of concern for a lot of our wildlife on public lands. So with that said, kind of that 10,000 foot view, we have went ahead and put together what I like to say a launching pad for public land managers to really, you know, investigate further into this complexity and also um, to innovatively think about new ways to, to manage our recreation use on public lands. So step one of this launching pad um, actually, I might just focus on this cool graphic here put together by Home Range. Just shows the extent of our public lands here in Washington. You know, we have so much forest service land, national park land, tribal land, um, so many state lands on top of all of that. Um, so it's, it's an incredible, you know, just graphic there to just note how much public land we have here in Washington. And that represents a lot of cool places for us to hang out as well as the critters in our forest. Um, so the first step, that we suggest for land managers with all this science um, in this report that we released is to first identify and map out where wildlife habitat and recreation overlap. That's just a great foundational piece of knowledge to really just like coalesce around and work from there to find innovative ways to promote coexistence. Number two is to measure recreation intensity and recreation frequency. Um, a big gap in knowledge that we've quickly found out is that we don't have great data for recreation use, uh, the time of year of recreation use, and exactly where recreationists are going out in our public lands. And so this is, uh, represents just like a key focus area for land managers to kind of get a better hold on, and they can better attribute the uh, recreation use with potential species thresholds, uh, where they can tolerate recreation or they can't uh, tolerate recreation, in which case would result in a temporary or permanent displacement from a particular area of public land. Number three, um, this is protecting spatial and temporal refugia. That's a fancy way of saying we need to protect the time and space that animals need, uh, particularly in quality habitat. Um, where, where species really uh, focus on winter habitat ranges or, or pertinent wildlife corridors that connect quality habitat with quality habitat across a, a fragmented landscape. 
So we know that you know, some animals uh, across different species have really special areas um, that need to be protected from human disturbance through recreation. Um, and then speaking on the time piece, we know that certain times of year, certain times of day are particularly vulnerable for, for wildlife. Um, uh, as I mentioned, in the winter months, it's particularly hard for uh, ungulates to survive those just harsh conditions. Um, and human disturbance from recreation can be just an excessive negative impact. And then this fourth um, element of this launching pad is kind of speaks to the, where the rubber meets the road. We need to implement new and innovative management actions, even with limited data or without the full um, data picture. Um, we need to be uh, flexible within that too. There's this common phrase used called adaptive management frameworks um, that speaks to the flexibility being innovative year after year uh, with new knowledge that comes uh, to the table as well as different uh, recreation uses that come to the table as well. Um, so kind of with this uh, big 10,000 foot view of our literature report, we did find some common trends found across different species when it comes to the science. Um, so I'll just start from the top here and work our way down, but we know that an animals have stronger responses to less predictable forms of recreation. Now, predictability in recreation can, can look like, you know, hiking on the same trail at a certain time of day. Um, an unpredictable or less predictable form of recreation might look like off-trail hiking or off-road uh, motorized use. Um, so we know that, generally speaking, animals um, are, are better adapted to predictable forms of recreation. Second is that re reproductive status is pretty important. We know that pregnant uh, individual females and young tend to be more vulnerable to this human disturbance that's caused through recreation activity. Seasonality is also very, very important, particularly during the winter times of the year where animals just need all the calories that they can get. And if we're disturbing or displacing hab or animals more than we need to, that uh, could spell a, a problem. Um, we know that habitat generalists are less vulnerable than habitat specialists. So some species in this report we found um, that they need a very specific list of attributes in a habitat. And so when they are disturbed or displaced from recreation, there's no other suitable place for them to go. So we, we are keenly aware that some of these species we've covered are like can't necessarily disperse or um, you know, be displaced to a suitable area other than the one that they're already in. Next, we know that some animals contain flexibility within their behavior. They can alter their, their activity to, to the nighttime, become a little bit more nocturnal, or they can be more crepuscular, going to the early dawn or late evening hours and save their activity for those, those moments in time. And then generally speaking, we know that as the intensity of recreation increases, so does the accumulative impact to wildlife. So the intensity of recreation, by that I mean the volume of recreation, the geographic footprint of recreation, the frequency, the time of year in which people are recreating more and more, that can be pretty problematic to, to animals. And then lastly, this is kind of an intuitive one, but important to voice nonetheless, is that different types of recreation activities have various impacts. And so, you know, we, we talk about motorized recreation, we talk about non-motorized rec non recreation. There's differences and distinctions between the exact impacts, but at the end of the day, they all cause this displacement and disturbance of wildlife. And, you know, combined with the accumulative rise that we see in recreation use on public lands, you know, it, it's not as important to distinguish between different recreation uses. It's more important to focus on the bigger picture, the cumulative effect of recreation use. Awesome. I'm going to hand it back to Becca, who's going to dive into some more species-specific information. Great. All right. So to give you a little bit of context before we dive into our species accounts, um, I want to uh, note the conservation status for each of these critters. And this is just, uh, we have here listed conservation status at the global uh, US and then Washington level, with green being the least concern, moderate yellow, purple high, and red extreme. And so this is just good info to come back to when considering implications, um, where impacts to species of high and extreme concern, such as mountain caribou and wolverines here in Washington, may be greater than those of least concern. With that in mind, I'm going to uh, go over some themes 
in terms of recreation impacts for these three different groups of animals um, that we highlighted in our report uh, that are found here in the Met How. And so just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna drill into any one individual species, um, but I really encourage you to check out our report and we have nice summarized key points for each individual animal if that's something that you're interested in. And then obviously happy to answer questions at the end. So starting with our ungulates, um, so these are our two-toed hooved animals. We have here mule deer, bighorn sheep, and mountain goats that we covered in the report. The first theme we've pulled out was that ungulates can be, while they can be habitat specialists, they use a large range of habitats um, with strong seasonal preferences. So for example, mule deer will float this green wave of forage up into the mountains in the summer before coming back down into the valley bottoms in the winter. Bighorn sheep and mountain goats, on the other hand, um, will inhabit these rocky outcrop areas um, to escape predators, and those are really specialized, important habitats to them. And then finally, while different species have these different preferences, ungulates can, in some cases, um, like mule deer, and I'm sure you've all seen this a little bit around town, habituate to human presence. So something to note there. Um, second theme was that wintering areas are really critical to most ungulate species. So because ungulates uh, eat plants and their hooved feet sink further and deeper into the snow than their predator counterparts, this means that secure habitats with some food availability uh, provide the best chance for these animals to be surviving the winter months. And third, like we saw in the broad trends, Reproductive seasons are particularly vulnerable times of year for all ungulates. So one thing to note here that's pretty cool about ungulates, however, is that they do exhibit it, this synchronized birthing. So um, they'll have all of their young during a really narrow window um, to try to swamp predators. So this means that the vulnerable period for them is quite condensed. Um, so going back to our key management focus areas, protecting important habitats, especially during critical times of year for ungulates, um, like these winter months or reproductive seasons, is probably the most important thing we can be doing right now for these populations. Moving on to our carnivores, which here in the Met How we have wolves, um, wolverines, cougars, lynx, and then our bears. Uh, Again, starting with reproductive seasons, this is a really strong theme throughout all of our critters. Um, these are especially important to carnivores, and particularly during denning periods and then um, when they're rearing young. So um, these young rearing areas include rendezvous sites for wolves or nursery habitats for lynx and cougars. And just one thing as we're putting things into perspective across different species here, um, an important consideration is that while Ungulates are basically born out of the womb, ready to run. Uh, carnivores are born in a less, much less developed stage, so they take a lot more time um, to develop and require weeks and months of more intensive parental care. So this means this, you know, period is it's a lot longer period of vulnerability for carnivores. So in addition, because carnivores occur in lower densities and are more territorial than herbivores. They generally need more space to thrive and survive. So each of these critters has home ranges and wanders territories of tens to hundreds of square miles, um, which needs they need which they need to both secure food and mates. Um, one cool thing about this group, though, is that they uh, will often exhibit some sort of behavioral flexibility, like Kurt was talking about, um, and shift how they use the landscape in response to recreation disturbance, so long as there are those spaces and times into which that they, they can move their um, activity. So, however, this ability to do so does vary uh, species to species, depending on their sensitivity to recreation, with our like wolverines and wolves being more sensitive to cougars and bears being a little bit less sensitive um, when we're looking at that spectrum. And so then, again, going back to those key management areas, the biggest thing that we can be actively doing right now to encourage carnivore recreation coexistence is to be tr protecting those times and places into which animals can move their activities, um, along with getting a better understanding of the thresholds at which they can tolerate recreation. And then finally, we have our avian group. So here we'd be talking about sage grouse and then our golden and bald eagle in the Met How. 
And this is a much broader grouping, um, but generally birds are easily disturbed and need some sort of buffers or visual barriers like trees or shrubs um, around the important habitats for feeding, breeding, uh, resting, and nesting. So yeah, again, like going back to all of those times, the young rearing times are really vulnerable uh, for, for these bird species, um, including both breeding areas like leks for sage grouse and then uh, nesting sites across all species. And finally, one thing that's particularly relevant for more specialized species, and this is a little bit more broadly speaking, but the sage grouse, um, who's a sagebrush habitat specialist, um, it's a good consideration here. They have dwindling habitat, and so there's also potentially indirect effects of recreation sometimes um, that could have big impacts on populations like unintentional fire ignitions or the spread of invasive species. So just another thing to keep in mind. In terms of key management focus areas here, birds are a great example of where we could perhaps be um, right off the bat implementing some adaptive management because they're a little bit easier to count in terms of um, those flight distances and things along those lines um, to see about how, yeah, there might be a direct population impacts. And so finally, going back to the trends found in the literature that Kurt was describing earlier, you can see how the responses we saw in ungulates, carnivores, and avian species here in the mountain mirror what we know more broadly about wildlife responses to recreation. And so as we're all thinking about potential impacts to a given species, these are ultimately the key considerations based on what we know right now um, in the scientific literature. And again, we still have a lot to learn. So that'll pass it back over to Kurt. Awesome, thanks Becca. Um, so we all got a mouthful of some pretty complex, pretty uh, fine scale science, right? And um, we wanted to take a moment today to kind of like look at a specific area that's been taking this science to heart and applying that to a recreation area that's quite busy and robust. Um, so that's actually our neighbors to the north in British Columbia and the municipality of Whistler. Um, back in 2016, launched this new trail network. It was specifically called the Alpine Trails Network. Contained 40 kilometers of these pristine area trails, um, all in alpine habitats. Contained awesome mountain biking trails, great backpacking and day hiking opportunities for people literally all over the world. We all know Whistler is pretty, pretty popular in terms of their recreation use. Um, so they, um, when putting this alpine trail network together, they had some basic principles that they brought to the planning table. Um, and these are great principles at that. So just wanted to share kind of these core tenets that they use. They, number one, knew that they wanted to minimize the impacts of wildlife, or of recreation on wildlife and their habits, uh, habitats, as well as their migration patterns through that area. Number two, they, they sought to identify actions to minimize the physical proximity of humans, the recreationists, and animals on these alpine trails. And three, um, they decided to really invest in an outreach and communication plan to make sure that responsible recreation was transpiring on this delicate trail network. But you know, in, in 2016, when this network was open to the public, they saw huge, huge recreation use, unsurprisingly so. They saw about 2,500 folks, mountain bikers and, and hikers and backpackers every single month, um, equating to about you know, 14,000 folks in that first, you know, I guess it was probably eight months in which they had those, those trails opened. And so they kind of went back to the table, to the drawing board, thinking, whoa, we need to rethink how we're going to make this sustainable as a network. Uh, you know, there were calls for, like, oh, we need to build more trails to accommodate more people. We need to, you know, go back to the drawing board to make sure that this is going to be suitable for folks 10 years down the road. And so what they did, they hired two different wildlife consultants to take inventory of their trail system to, to really pinpoint, ooh, where can we improve? Where are our blind spots in our trail planning process right now? And what can we do to improve this trail as it exists? So one, they, they said right off the bat, we need to not build any trails, and these were for future trails, and identified sensitive habitat. They, they uh, had these third-party consultants really define sensitive habitat on a, on a map basis that was just very clear that no building trails should um, occur there. 
Second was to reconsider future trail plans and known critical habitat. That's just a continuation of this first point, but really just being explicit to, to make sure that any future trail planning would avoid critical habitat for a variety of different wildlife. And number three, they decided to reroute existing trails that saw that high interaction or physical proximity between humans and, and wildlife species across that landscape. Number four, um, they, they, they quickly saw and realized that their communication and outreach plans were not robust enough. So they decided to be a lot more intentional about installing more signage and signage that in, like included an engaging content that was succinct yet effective. And they also, this is a big point too, installed more monitoring systems. They hired more backcountry rangers to get a better sense of, you know, how are folks behaving on these trails? Are folks abiding by the rules and regulations or are they not? And, and why is that, right? Um, so they found that to be a huge piece to increase the sustainability of trail use out there. And number five, they actually came to restrict certain recreation uses um, that are more prone to that unpredictability of recreation that we know full well is a little bit harder for wildlife to sustain. And so in this particular instance in the Alpine Trail Network, they decided to restrict e-bike access as well as um, recreation that includes docks on certain trails just to, you know, you know be better or more sustainable for, for wildlife in that sense. And so, you know, drawing from this case study in Whistler, which is still unfolding in front of us, um, and as well as kind of like looking across the country to see what other places across the U.S. are doing in terms of recreation and, and wildlife coexistence, we have some just general coexistence strategies that we just wanted to synthesize for you all. Um, number one is to really intentionally work with wildlife experts to identify the overlap between critical habitat and wildlife habitat um, with recreation uh, and recreation used areas. Second is to seek to understand recreation data, recreation uh, use in certain areas of the state and here in the Met House specifically, we need to understand the patterns and behavior of recreation use year after year and then apply that to what we know from a wildlife perspective and how much they can c sustain in terms of recreation use. Number three, this is that basic, you know, we need to protect the time and space that wildlife need, whether that's on a finer scale or a larger scale. And number four, this is more of a philosophical, philosophical one, but it really important nonetheless to bring to the table is this open-mindedness and this ability to, to take new innovative and creative ideas to heart, to, you know, to be flexible and adaptive to new ways to do recreation management. Number five is, is really key to the rubber meets the road is communicating out with different stakeholders, uh, making sure you're closely collaborating with land managers. And then this is another really important one that we've found in some additional literature is tourism. Tourism is a huge first you know, line of communication with a lot of the recreating public, especially out of towners or folks from other parts of the state. Um, kind of the communication between all of these different elements is so, so, so important to make sure that we're all synchronized on this stuff. And then we went a step further with this report to kind of synthesize key messages for recreationists, for, your, for you, for, for me, as I love to recreate in the mountains as much as possible. Um, so our, our first key point here for you all tonight is that it's sticking to trails to be more predictable is a thumbs up for wildlife. That's a great way that we can reduce our impact to these sometimes fragile or vulnerable critters on our landscapes. Second, is trying to do the majority of our activities during the daytime. We know that some animals can, can you know, uh, be flexible and move their activities towards the nighttime or towards those early morning area, um, times of day or those late dusk hours um, at night. So um, the more that we can be active during the daytime, we think that could be better implications for, for wildlife and their viability. Third is to respect seasonal or temporary closures and restrictions. I think this is a pretty easy one that we can get lots of folks on board with. We know that some land managers put these restrictions or temporary you know, closures in place to protect certain species that we know need of uh, winter range protected or certain times of year um, to make sure that they re uh, remain viable year after year. And then this last one here is we encourage folks to think about consolidating their recreation footprint. Um, this comes from some of the data that says that 
expanding recreation geographic footprints is, is harder for wildlife, you know, where we live in a finite world with so much, or with just a small amount of public lands with, with viable habitat that's also finite. And so we encourage folks to, to think about, you know, staying local or, or hiking that popular trail that you did last week and finding fun and, and, and meaningful visitor experiences with that. Um, and so with that said, you know, that's, that's something to grapple with with her own recreation habits. I know that I do that with my own recreation practices every weekend. Um, but we encourage folks to kind of take that to heart and to think about how, you know, recreation does influence our landscapes. And it's, the onus is partially on us to make sure that we're recreating in the best way possible. So um, with that, you know, this leads us into kind of how we take this to the next level here in a community level. And we're just so happy to have Alan Jersick with us with the Met Howe Trails Collaborative. Um, I think it's just like great way to, you know, take all this information, all this science, all these broad implications and put it into practice. Uh, the Met Howe is completely unique in the sense that y'all are pretty tight knit, already have great stuff going for you in terms of wildlife conservation and sustainable recreation use. And Alan just represents um, a great community that's already in place to continue this great work. So with that said, I'll pass it on to, to Alan Jersick. Great, uh, thanks for that introduction, Kurt. And thanks to both of you for sharing this wonderful research you've done with the community and uh, extending the invite to me to talk about our organization a little bit. Um, so. There are a lot of recreation stakeholders in the Metha Valley. Um, the Metha Valley Trails Collaborative aims to bring those stakeholders together to accomplish what they would not be able to do independently, um, ultimately enhancing relationships and building more sustainable trail resources in the valley. And a sustainable trail resource can just be a well-maintained trail or uh, more well-educated trail users um, about how we can cohabitate with our ecological community. Um, the purpose of the organization is to accomplish what these individual entities would not be able to do independently uh, by bringing them together in a collaborative group. That looks like um, developing trail information, so like helping to share some of those seasonal closures with trail users, um, coordinating projects, maintenance projects are a big one, leveraging shared resources like tools, uh, volunteer time, and funding for projects, and then focusing on projects that benefit the entire Metha Valley trail community. Um, I think this picture is from a project that I coordinated this past summer. Um, replacing a trail bridge on the multi-use Lightning Creek Trail. Uh, up, it crosses Beaver Meadows, not that far from here. Um, and yeah, it, replacing this trail bridge helped protect aquatic species habitat by preventing trail users from you know, crossing the stream bank, uh, having increased sediment go into the stream. Um, and it allows sustainable access for all those people. Um, so it was a great project that highlights the successes of the collaborative because we had folks from the Northwest Motorcycle Association, the Evergreen Backcountry, sorry, Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance, um, Backcountry Horsemen, Met Howe Trails, um, and the United States Forest Service all helping to make this project happen um, in collaboration, coordinated through the Trails Collaborative. Um, I'm the first staff member of this organization, and a lot of people have asked me if I founded the organization, and I think it's important to recognize the work that's been done that I could then move forward with. Um, it was the need for the the need for better communication was recognized in 2016, um, and the collaborative group sort of formalized and established a charter that year. Um, some of its early successes were passing, some, helping to get some legislation passed to bring more trail funding to the valley, um, and then beginning to facilitate annual volunteer trail maintenance events called Save a Trail. Um, 2016 through 2019 had successful Save a Trails. Um, unfortunately, uh, that increase in user um, Trail users that Becca alluded to due to the COVID-19 pandemic also reduced our ability to gather in large groups outdoors. So there was a little bit of a hiatus for um, volunteer trail maintenance events happening. Uh, and that also postponed some grant funding the organization was successful to get to ultimately hire my position. So a little bit of a lull for the organization that was ultimately uh, a boon for me because I got a new job. Um, uh, and since I started in April of this past year, um, I've been trying to help to expand the network of um, partner organizations we have, continue to facilitate more of these maintenance projects with volunteers and um, AmeriCorps staff. And then I've been, so these are some of the highlights of that project, I think, or of, of the summer. I was able to work on 19 different trails with 399 volunteer hours, uh, 14 separate events. Um, this was one of the last events of that trail project. Uh, 
And I think it's great in this picture, it is representatives from the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance, from the Northwest Motorcycle Association, um, off-duty land managers, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Daff House was there. Um, so yeah, that was, again, great project. And these are some of the other fun successes we had. Uh, we've also been successful in securing funding to continue uh, maintaining trail projects in the Valley. Um, this upcoming season, we're intending to increase our impact um, by facilitating more consistent volunteer projects. Um, in addition, some of the projects we're excited about are working on some of those high volume trails in the Highway 20 corridor, performing, defor performing deferred maintenance so that those high volume trails can help to maintain in a sustainable way the level of traffic that they see, um, helping to restore trails affected by the Cedar Creek fire, and then was successful in getting a grant to replace more trail bridges, uh, to continue to coordinate trail bridges, trail bridge replacement with multiple stakeholders. Um, and finally, the, in addition to volunteer events, one of the ways we're gonna be able to accomplish these projects is with supervising some AmeriCorps trail crews. Um, some of those are tied to that Highway 20 deferred maintenance and that Cedar Creek work, and uh, was excited to be included in an application that TwistWorks put in to bring an AmeriCorps crew to the valley that's going to work with myself at the Trails Collaborative and then the Housing Trust and Classrooms in Flume. So just another cool way that collaboration is happening through these groups. If you're interested in getting involved, uh, one of the mainstays of the Trails Collaborative since its inception has been a bi-monthly public meeting. That's kind of where all the stakeholders get together and discuss issues facing us as trail users and trail advocates. Um, it's typically well attended. Our, by land managers, advocates, and just generally interested parties. Our next meeting is on the 21st at the Winthrop Public Library from 9 to 11. Um, so it should be a good time. The May 20th through the 21st, we're planning just kind of an early season larger party, hoping to have a good, good attendance uh, and try and have it be one of those projects that benefits multiple trail users, as many user groups as we can possibly incorporate. So. Save the date for that one, and if for whatever reason you have plans and you don't want to come uh, volunteer with us on that day, feel free to reach out and try and find a day that can work, because we're always happy to have people come out, make more connections um, with each other as trail users, and provide the opportunity for people to give back to the recreation resources that make this place such an awesome, awesome area to live and recreate and visit. So that'll pass it back to Kurt. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for that, Alan. I really appreciate that. and really exemplifies what an amazing trail network we have here in the Met Howe already. And we encourage folks to, to invest in the sustainability of those trails. And, and the collaborative really represents an awesome community to really you know, apply a lot of the stuff in our literature report and you know, talk with different stakeholders, talk with land managers, and, um, and then work with different yeah, aspects of tourism here in the Met Howe to really you know, bolster sustainable recreation and balance wildlife with recreation moving forward. Um, so folks, like, uh, we're, we're here to, for you know, another few minutes to answer some questions publicly, but I wanna encourage you to check out the literature report that we released last fall with Home Range Wildlife Research. Here's the QR code. We also have a couple of copies just to look at. Please don't take them home. Um, just in the corner over there by the American flag. Um, we have some emails listed down below. Please reach out to us after tonight if we can't answer a question. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for coming and we can take a few questions here. Um, we'll encourage uh, Becca and Alan to come on up and field some of these. <laughs>